Yes, it is possible to embrace two equally contradictory emotions, to wit, a hate and a love of a steel plant, a fear and a fascination of the beauty ensconced in the industrial scars. Why should it matter anymore that companies close down, lock, lock up and go away forever, leaving the hiring of legions of working people to someone else? Why well, care that the children and neighbors of steelworkers won't have union jobs with union wages waiting for them when they leave school? It gave this project boy a job and a living wage when I came out of college, when there was nothing else for me, nothing worth mentioning. For years, my union wages gave me a chance to own my own auto, pay my own rent, chase my dreams. Now, for the thousands left behind, there will be few doctors, lawyers, and teachers coming from the families of working people. Forty years after the shutdown, the plant dismantled, sold off for scrap. Brownfields doomed to sit untouchable with 20, 21st century windmills as a backdrop. Steel City all but boarded up its neighbor Buffalo only now recovering, if in fact it is recovering, if in fact it will ever recover. A nation that needs to be rebuilt in steel now reduced to armies of shopping mall clerks, bank money thumbers, and McDonald's burger wrappers, many of whom will live with their parents well into their 40s. I think I began to show artistic ability or at least an inclination to make art when I was nine years old and I did a copy of one of those drawings on the back of a uh, uh, comic book. If you can copy this or draw this, you can. it could be worth a thousand dollars. My father had been president of the Pastel Society of Buffalo in 1951. So I showed it to him. Our family had been going through some financial troubles and uh, I thought I could be the family hero if I can draw this, I would get a thousand dollars. And he explained to me, no, that's a scholarship. And then he looked at my drawing and he said, yeah, you'll never be an artist. That discouraged me <laughs> for, for about 15 years. I took studio and art at Kensington High School from the same teacher who taught Russell Ram. She flunked me. <laughs> I had um, five A's and about a hundred F's because I didn't complete assignments. It was a bad year in my life, family breaking up, whatnot. You know, but I, I ended up being pretty much self-taught. During a particularly bad winter, no work, um, I had nothing to do and lots of time to do it. I was waiting for the heat to be turned on in my apartment. Two of my housemates had moved out. One had left behind a box of acrylics. The other had left behind a roll of canvas. So I thought, why don't I try painting? So I started doing copies of Masterwork, Picasso's Three Dancers, and then Van Gogh's uh, Wheat Fields and Cypress trees. I was dating a woman who, was, uh, who taught jewelry. We used to go to the art gallery and have discussions about art. Was there an exhibition I went to that wowed me or moved me one way or another? Western New York open exhibition, I think it was 1981. And I went in there with my then girlfriend and I said, anybody can do this. You know, the old argument, anybody can do this. She said, well, why don't you? And I said, fine, two years from now, I'll, I'll, I'll be in the next one because I had just started painting. And two years later, I was in the next West New York art exhibition. Beginner's luck, I was in the, uh, I was in the Albright Knox Art Gallery. I haven't hit that high since, well, the Parthenon in Nashville. I did get that 
a solo exhibition there, which was made me very, very happy. I've created, I'm estimating about 2,300 artworks in my life. Um, maybe four or 500 of them are buried, covered over. And what made that easy is that I've worked in acrylics and pastels, uh, which means you get nearly immediate results. At some point, you start to see that you have a theme or something that reflects your artistic philosophy. Most of the work I've done ha has been nocturnes. I grew up in the Kenfield projects. Since we didn't have air conditioning, we would have hot summer nights. We did a lot of sitting out under street lamps, street corner philosophizing. There was a certain magic to the lighting of the night. The street lamps, the, the warm lighting inside the apartments, uh, the headlights. I've always been mesmerized by the beauty of the night, which so many people miss. And also for me, it was uh, a niche that I haven't had never seen covered that much by other artists. And then driving around in the country. I've done Southwestern, uh, maybe about 100 Southwestern works. I did spend a lot of time there. I've done a, many, many industrial uh, steel plant. I used to work at Bethlehem Steel. I wrote a book of poetry about it. Stealing America, my poetic memoir of working in the coke ovens, mainly at Bethlehem Steel here in Lackawanna. I have a series that I'm working on about things that we throw away. Uh, I call it Left for Dead. Um, all the plastic, the burned out autos, the refuse of American excess. I put a lot of automobiles in my artwork because that's my main environmental statement. They've been such a, a blessing and yet such a curse for mankind. They also, you know, have contributed much to global climate change. And I have a Through the Rain Blurred Windshield series, which for me is probably the most exciting because it it's the most freeing. It allows me to be abstract, uh, but do a kind of abstract realism, you, where you can identify what's in the work, but the movement of the paintbrush over the canvas um, gives you a lot of latitude for playing with the color. It's kind of like a you know, I see, you know, kind of like a fusion of Van, not that I'm on their level, but it's kind of a fusion of Van Gogh and Birchfield. You know, that kind of playfulness, the kind of energy that comes out of looking at this mix of colors and, uh, and movement, dynamic movement. The word I've used to describe myself is techno-luminous. Uh, light of technology, kind of a fusion of styles and, and artistic attitudes coming through the civilized landscapes of George Innes through uh, Hopper, Birchfield, some of the regionalists. I did so much work from photographs. You know, you, you go through hundreds of photographs and the ones that keep drawing me back are the ones that I want to turn into artworks. If you keep coming back to the same image, you might analyze what's in the image, the geometry, if you, if you will, the color, uh, just the arrangement of objects within the composition. Then I throw it up on my computer screen and work from it. I almost never follow what's on the computer screen, even if I'm doing something completely representational or close to photoreal. 
I, I feel like I have to impose some kind of artist decision on it, you know, to alter color, maybe tweak a value here or there, change the arrangement of the objects here and there, uh, to make it more visually interesting. I don't like doing drab realism. I strive for color unity in my palette. Generally, there's a an underlying color to a composition, uh, something that kind of prevails throughout the composition, and then you modify it whatever way. If you're doing a portrait, it might come up from the darks into the lights. I do pretty much what everybody has done with acrylic. It it's so versatile it's so forgiving uh, one technique that I kind of found on my own and I wrote about it in an article in pastel journal is to create the underpainting with pastels very often I'll do an underpainting on color fixed sanded paper to lay that predominant color in if there are large swatches of certain passages of color, I might smear the uh, pastel on and then use a paintbrush and either water, because the color fix is pretty much waterproof, or isopropyl alcohol, and I advise people not to drink the alcohol. Uh, and I'll, I'll smear the... Um, the colors is so that essentially I'm using the pastels as almost a watercolor uh, for, a, for a base coat and the other thing that this does is it fixes the pastels so that you don't have as much dusk and that's an issue for me because I I had lung cancer and I have to be careful with the dust um, and then I do the finishing with um, whatever I need to do in pastels and I just keep working generally to a softer pastel until I get the composition that I want. I guess I feel very rich. People come in here and they see art all over the place and most of the art is mine. It is not an ego trip. It is, I look at this work and sometimes my wife writes poetry and sometimes she looks at a work and she writes a poem about the work. Sometimes I write a poem about the work or a story. Uh, it's also kind of a, you know, a domestic retrospective. Can I say, you know, I, I look at all this work that I have hanging on my walls and I, I don't go, well, I've done enough, I can quit now. It makes me want to do more. That's, that's the important thing. It makes me want to make more art. I would love to be in several museums. I would love to be in several galleries, but, and I wrote an article about this for uh, Art Calendar magazine you want to create the kind of art, you know, like if it's a landscape, it's a landscape with an exclamation point. It's a floral with an exclamation point, a portrait with an exclamation point. It's the first time I went into the Met, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I had no idea how much was there, what was there. I, I knew there were, of course, because it's the Met, great works, but... <laughs> I walked in there and I didn't know that there were whole rooms devoted to individual masters. Um, each impressionist had his own room, the post-impressionist, the Falvis, and I walked into the room with the Van Goghs and there was Wheatfield and Cypress Trees, one of the first paintings. I ever made a copy of. I made it the same size too. 
And I just stopped dead in my tracks. I sat on the bench there and I sobbed, you know. It just moved me so much that, you know, this was a man who lived and died to inspire me that way. Um, and I owed so much to him for that. And I think that's what I want to do. That's what I shoot for. I want to cre create something with a wow factor. Not to say I'm better than any other artist, but it's to say I made a connection with you, a solid connection with you. There once was another star of Bethlehem, a steel plant in Lackawanna, three miles long, one mile deep, clanging, screeching, and rumbling amidst the sweat and work of 20,000 men. Thank you.